Dr. Mark Changisi, welcome to Shrinkwrap Radio. It's great to be here. Well, it's really great to have you. We're going to be discussing your book, Expressly Human, Decoding the Language of Emotion. And um, it, at the outset, I want to say it's written in a very fresh and readable way. So I want to let our, our listeners and viewers know that. Um, in one place, you are described as an evolutionary biologist. What is that, and how does one become one of those? Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to characterize what I am. Just the real story is I was physics, math, undergrad, uh, PhD was math. But I, you know, if you read my high school letter to college, it, it said I'm going to go. I want to answer the questions to the universe. I want to want to understand consciousness and all of the deep philosophical slash cognitive kinds of cool questions in the universe. And I said, but I need to go do math and physics first and possibly even a PhD in math. So then after my PhD in math, my first job was a computer scientist professor in Ireland. And then I started doing postdocs. I was a postdoc in neuroscience and psychology at Duke University, won a Sloan Swartz Fellowship in neuro theoretical neuroscience at Caltech. I was there for a few, four, four or so years. And I was a cognitive science professor up at RPI up in upstate New York. And then I started my own research institute about 12 years ago. Uh, and so I've been sort of an independent academic, free from academia, uh, sort of buying my intellectual freedom. And I started a company, Vino Optics, that sort of comes out of my tech, some, some, some of my research um, that funds me. So, I, so I, I'm really, an, a lot of the stuff that I work on is evolutionary biology, but it's really always about why we are the way we are, why we are engineered the way we are. And often you're looking at natural selection let's say why we have color vision. We have color vision, I argued, not because of finding fruit in the forest. Colors actually allows you to see oxygenation modulations of blood under the skin. It's actually peculiarly optimized so that primates can see emotions on their skin, blushes, ah. blanches, and things like this. Um, you get pruny fingers, just to give you a couple of natural selections. You yeah. get pruny fingers because they're actually optimized for rain, rain treads. They actually... Op are optimal for channeling out the water so that you don't hydroplane when you're primate or gripping in wet or dewy circumstances. Interesting. And a lot of the other stuff is cultural evolution. Like culture itself is a, is a blind watchmaker like natural selection. And over time, so the, the reason that we can read at all is not that we evolved to read, but because cultural selection over time l turned letters and made them look like something we're already good at seeing. Namely, letters look like the contour conglomerations that happen out in nature, the kinds of T-junctions that occur when a contour goes behind something, and Y-junctions. And you can work out the space of all the possible junctions. Some of them happen commonly in the world. Some of them are rare in the world. The ones that happen commonly in the world in three-dimensional environments are the ones that you find across hundreds of human writing systems. So wow. you end up with the Worlds. That's the kind of stuff that I work that's, on. That's that's really fascinating because uh, I I started to think about tree twigs, and I would imagine twigs could also be seen as those kinds of junctures that you're talking about. So that it, could, the first thing that comes to mind when you think of a Y for a layman when you say a Y junction, for example, might be a, a twig, but that's yeah. not actually what we mean. When we say a Y junction, we mean just like to look up in the to the corner of the room that you're in, and you look yeah. at the three dimensional inner corner, for example. Um, then you're looking at a Y junction of three contours that meet from three different angles. From in, three. Yeah, and okay. or, the, or the outside corner of a, of a box, which will, again will be three contours meeting. Um, an actual Y junction, which is not a true junction of a twig, would actually just be a three dimensional, you know, it, it, from sufficiently far away, it might look vaguely contour like, but it's in fact not a. Um, it would not count as one of these junctions. But you're using rooms and domiciles as examples of this. And would we have had rooms and domiciles already when uh, when writing began? No. So so the uh, I just use it because odds are you were <laughs> and the listener was reading or sitting in a room where they could see these things. So the, the way that we actually test this is any kind of world in which there are opaque objects, opaque macroscopic you know, objects are gonna have a particular signature distribution of which kinds of, of these contour conglomerations or junction types occur. And then you can work it out. You can say, yeah, as long as it's just any sort of random-ish opaque object environment, you end up with certain kinds of things. X's are rare. 
for example, X's don't happen amongst opaque objects very often, but L junctions and T junctions happen a lot. Um, whenever objects go behind each other, you get a T junction. Now, if it's a semi-transparent world, like if you're living in a world with like jellyfish floating around, or, like you can imagine a world that's not like our opaque world, in which case you would get a different distribution, different, different kinds of, of those junctions would be really common compared to us today. And they would have a different kinds of writing systems, animals that evolved in a world that was all semi-transparent. And so you, they would end up with the different kinds of brains that are good at processing different kinds of junctions and end up with a different kind of writing system. But um, most creatures that you could possibly imagine on most planets probably are walking around with opaque objects, which means that they're going to have writing systems that are probably vaguely like ours that we find here on Earth, because they're going to end up with the same universal pattern of which junctions are common and which junctions are not, because it's a fundamental mathematical thing, not per se a savanna thing or a forest thing. It's just a very fundamentally um, universal kind of struck, uh, uh, mathematical result. Wow. <laughs> it's interesting that mathematics uh, comes into play here. Now, you mentioned other planets with, with beings on them. Uh, is that something that you actually think is out there or just a random example? It's just, I mean, I'm in the in this case, I'm just using it as a thought experiment. I, sometimes it's nice to think in those terms because once you have a discovery, you it can sometimes be useful to say, how universal is this? Like, is this stuff that we do? Like, for example, we all see illusions, uh, the kind of geometrical illusions. And one of my arguments is that the reason we see illusions is like, this is because it's very fundamental. You have a delay when light hits your eye, it takes about a 10th of a second before you create a perception. So in real life, you don't want to just generate perceptions based on what hit your eye. You want to anticipate what the next moment's going to look like, because that way, by the time you've built your perception, that perception is of the present. So it turns out that a lot of these illusions that you see, and I have a TED talk on this, that like the ones where you have a bunch of radial lines and two vertical lines, and the two vertical lines appear to bow outwards. Yeah. Those radial lines are exactly the kinds of cues that you get when you move forward. When you move forward, you get optic blur on your retina or any kind of alien eyeball, right? You'd have stuff flowing outwards when you move forward. And any alien in any part of the universe anywhere is, doesn't want instant, is not gonna have instantaneous perceptions. They're gonna take a little bit of time to compute it, which means they're gonna have the same illusions that we are because those illusions are just following the, the, di the dynamics of projective geometry and how projective geometry changes in the next moment. So then you can say, wow, these illusions, which seem really peculiar and something funny about humans, no, they're not peculiar. They're a universal expected thing. Whereas color vision, the red-green color vision that we primates evolved is peculiar because it really has to do with seeing the weird oxygenation modulations of hemoglobin under the skin, which is something that no alien is going to give a damn about, right? Like that's just a really peculiarly human thing. Maybe they've got other perceptual things that help them read the emotions on you know, their species, on, but it, it's not going to see red-green in the way that we see red green because we're so that would not be something you don't expect aliens to see reds and greens on colored in the world like we do but we do expect them to see illusions um, of, of the geometrical kinds of illusions like we do and i think that's useful that's sort of that's informative and it, it makes it fun yeah um just to make sure i'm following here so you're saying we perceive color so that we can tell what the emotional states are of our fellow human beings. That's right. So the primates, uh, uh, mammals generally um, have have just two dimensions. They have gray scale, um, black to white, and all the grays in between. And then they have yellow blue as opposites. So they have a two dimensional palette of all of those. Uh, some of us primates um, then evolved the third dimension, this red, uh, a new red green axis. And for 100 years, people had hypothesized that this red green dimension that we primates have Maybe it's for finding fruit in the forest because there's a lot of colorful fruit or young versus old leaves because the younger ones are more edible. But there was never any real good argument for that because it's not, there's nothing about our, our kind of, our kind of color vision is peculiar in a particular way. Like uh, your camera has three filters, one sort of low wavelength blue filter and then a middle sort of a filter and then another one in the red. It's sort of uniformly distributed across the spectrum. And that's kind of what you'd want. Birds and other kind of um, other non-mammal vertebrates have four cones, actually. They've got four, a, an extra dimension above us, but they're uniformly distributed across the spectrum, kind of like you'd expect if it's sort of a general engineering design to just be able to see different kinds of spectra so you can maybe sense the world better. But ours is not. We have one low one, and then 
we have the old one that was uh, around 540 nanometers. And then we got a new one right next to it. So we've got one way down here and then two that are like side by side. Now it turns out you have to have, have a new one exactly side by side in exactly that spot to sense the oxygenation variations of blood of hemoglobin under the skin. It's exactly where it needs to be to see these signals that are, are available when we're oxygenated, deoxygenated under the skin. So, um, and then we evolved loss of fur. So the animals that are the primates that have color vision are also the naked ones. So nakedness and color vision are sort of opposite sides of the same coin. They go hand in hand, co-evolved together. Uh-huh, very, very interesting. Are there any other uh, species that perceive color? Well, so outside of the mammals, yeah. outside of the mammals, there, uh, the, you know, lo lots, of, lots of fish, most of the birds, some of the rep reptiles have four dimensions. So they actually have, and they're so more uniformly distributed. So it seems to be maybe a, a, a general argument that it's just sort of general perception, not really peculiarly designed for their own bodies or something like that. Oh, I'm sorry, you just cut out. I just lost the sound. Okay, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay, yeah, you cut out for a bit. Um, you remember where I where I where you last heard me? <laughs> no, <laughs> it's going pretty quickly. Yeah, uh, I'm curious about the fourth dimension that you mentioned that birds and some other creatures have. Is that always the same fourth dimension, like heat or magnetism, or you know what kinds of fourth well, dimensions just, are we talking about? Well, so I, when I say four dimensions, I mean four color dimensions. So it just means that across the across the wavelengths from you know, 400 nanometers, mm. 700 nanometers from really blue to to the highest reds near infrared. Okay. Uh, you know, dogs and bunny rabbits and horses, they just sample two parts. We primates sample three parts with two of them side by side. And then many of these other animals have four spread over. They, so they're seeing pretty much the same parts of the spectrum as we are in terms of the totality of what's visible to them, but they are sampling four different spots. So they can see more color distinctions between things. They can ah. see two things that might look the same to us. They see color differences in a different dimension, just like red green is a dimension that we can see that your dog can't even see. Like um, he's just blind to it. Um, they can see dimensions, fourth dimensions of color distinctions that we can't see. Wow, and I assume there are ways that in which that's very adaptive for the environment that they're in. Yeah, so it must be. I I don't know what the jet what because there's so many birds and reptiles and fish that have vaguely uniformly distributed four cones. You know, you might expect them to be, um, and they're so uniformly distributed. It seems like sort of a general spec, like a good spectrometer. A spectrometer is just a device that humans made to measure let's say, you know, 400 different spots, different wavelength frequencies to get like the full distribution of something. And they have four and it's uniformly distributed. So it seems, you know, my, I don't have any good ideas for exactly why they are other than just a good general sense of what kinds of uh, spectral differences are in the environment. Whereas for us, it's very peculiarly, not just that, it's about health and emotion and state of those around us. Because as deeply social creatures, um, we now uh, rely a lot on our emotional expressions and um, color being uh, one big one. Okay, so um, your book asserts that we humans existed communally for a long time without language. Um, wh wh do we know when we developed language? No one is sure 100%, uh, 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 but we, we tend to think it's in the 100 to 500,000 range you know, a couple hundred thousand years that we've had language spoken language as we kind of understand it today and so it is i think one useful way to get into this book is to talk about an earlier book and i hinted at it when i talked about the evolution of writing systems and how writing systems have evolved to look like something that we're already good at seeing right yeah writing evolved to look like nature because we didn't ever we never evolved to read and so to turn our brains and to harness them and to become a reading brain, cultural evolution said, okay, if cultural evolution could talk, it's saying, okay, I've got to make these letters look such that the words are roughly object-like is one way to think about it. By having yeah. the, letter, the letters look like parts of objects or the corners of objects and things like this, then the words themselves look roughly like objects and it makes it something that we, our brains, our object recognition system can absorb naturally and easily. 
And that's why we're such good readers. We can read, you know, thousands and thousands of words per day. We read more than we listen to probably on an average day. Now, any creature, any alien that was observing us from space today would think we must have surely evolved to read when you see how quickly kids read, how much we read. And even we have brain parts of our brain that even science, neuroscientists call visual reading areas. They don't believe that they're actually evolved for it, but they call them that because they seem to be so in, you know, so purposed towards that. But it's not because they were purposed towards that per se. It's that cultural evolution tricked writing to look like what we're already good at. Now, the same for language generally. So in Harnessed, an earlier book, Harnessed, I argue that language itself, spoken language, we never evolved. Uh, so people like Steven Pinker argue that we evolved over long epochs to have a language instinct. So that's one typical argument. And he, there's a lot of good arguments for why it really does seem to be an instinct. And then the other side is that, no, it's not something we ever evolved to do. It's just one of the silly things that humans do, like riding horses, all kinds of stuff that we do, right, that we shouldn't be doing, but we figure it out because we're very plastic. So Pinker's always, Pinker's point, and I'm, I agree with Pinker, is that, no, we're, we are not very plastic. We're no more plastic than any other animal. This idea that we're universal general, you know, universal learning machines, somehow special from all of the instinct animals, and we're not animals filled with insects. No, we're just like them. There's no difference. Where Pinker is wrong is that even writing looks to be an instinct. It has all of the smell of an instinct, right? But we know it's not an instinct because most of us have great grandparents who could barely read or, you know, you go three generations back. Reading is a very recent thing, and it's obviously a, 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 an invention or a cultural uh, evolution. <coughs> the argument that I made was that even the sounds of speech culturally evolved to sound like events, the events amongst solid objects. And you just like you can work out the kinds of... <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, you, you can work out the kinds of contour conglomerations that happen in natural scenes, like we talked about. You can also work out the math of what solid objects sound like when they hit and slide. So for example, the basic two things that solid objects do are, are what they hit or they slide hits are like plosives like slides two things that are sliding together are like fricatives like all these kinds of fricatives that we have like f and s and sh and things like this and when something hits when something hits or something slides the objects ring they vibrate those are like vowels or sonorants is the more general word. And the basic structure of anything is always a hit and a ring or a slide and a ring. And that's just a syllable. And that's just the beginning. So there's, this is a, then you can start working out more complex mathematical properties of what solid, what real events in nature are like. Whether you're on Mars, anywhere there's any kinds of solid objects, there's a fundamental math to the kinds of uh, grammatical combinations that they make. And then you can show over and over again, my God, all human languages have these fundamental signature features that you find amongst solid objects. So again, the story is language itself, not just writing, spoken language itself evolved to sound like something that we already evolved to be good at hearing. Namely, mm. we're only good at hearing just events in the world. So cultural evolution said to itself, we better damn well make spoken language sound like solid object events that happen in the world because that's what these creatures are good at. It's the only thing, because we're not going to make them learn something crazy and new. If, we, if I wanted you to read and I said, okay, let's just give you barcodes, we could train chill, poor kids up for thousands of hours, you know, until they're 18 years old, and they're, they're going to read at one one thousandth the rate that they read today, right? You, you, the, you can't just train people on things they're not designed for. So uh, writing mm -hmm. the sounds of speech and language themselves culturally evolved with no designer to be something that, so the, this, back to the emotion side, what this means is that prior thousand years ago or 200,000 years ago, but prior to us having spoken language, we had no language at all. We were just as smart, we were humans, or, or you could maybe, maybe we were slightly earlier hominid, whether we were a fool, but there, there's a whole 5 million years of time when we have these really smart hominids and, you know, prior to the chimpanzees, but even chimpanzees, incredibly smart creatures, right? Even dogs, incredibly smart creatures, and they can't say a lick. They have spent their whole life coordinating social environments of 
people that want to, you know, beat them up and they're vying for, you know, all kinds of political power plays that happen, very complex dynamics that happen amongst all of these, these groups. And they couldn't say anything. I, you can hardly imagine going one day without saying anything, but most of, of the history of hominids and, of, of, and, and, we, and all of the history of all of the other smart animals that you know of had never spoke a word. And I think if you start thinking that through, I call this the silent movie problem, just trying to imagine how it could be that smart creatures like us and lesser but still smart creatures are like all the other social smart social creatures, other primates and, and parrots and, you know, and, and, and all these different how do they get by doing all of this coordinated behavior in the social communities, never saying a word and never having language at their disposal? So it, after writing Harnessed, in some sense, it was almost incumbent upon me to say, okay, what clearly the an answer is something to do with the kinds of emotional expressions the social animals have. Social animals are the ones that are always emotionally expressing. So really then this was a year work with Tim Barber and I trying to work out the mathematical of what a language, I say language in quotes, it's not an actual language in the, in the grammar sense, um, but what kind of language or communications would social animals have to have in order to communicate with one another without a proper language? And what would it have to be? And then when you work it out, so the short story is when you work that out from first principles, then you can derive this particular system is the only system that animals need it would have to be like this is the only way they can communicate communicate in order to honestly signal somewhat honestly signal to one another to carry out the kinds of compromises and negotiations they need to and you end up with the emotional expressions the repertoire of them behaving as they as they in fact are so that's the kind of story that it is but i haven't actually told, told you the story yeah uh you mentioned tim barber and he's the co-author of the book yeah. that we're uh discussing and uh how did you What's his background? Does he have the same background that you do? Yeah, we have, training? We, have, we have similar kind of backgrounds. We're both, uh, we actually went to high school together and college together. And then he wow. went to Princeton Mathematics. I went to, um, uh, for his PhD, I went to University of Maryland Mathematics. Uh, he went off and started companies, uh, started companies and, and did very well and sold. Meanwhile, I was a, did the normal professor route for 20 years. And then after that, we decided, let's go start a research institute to AI, uh, the number two AI.org was then our research institute in 2010. So I left academia and he and I began working together, building companies and doing research together. So, um, but yeah, he's, he's a mathematician of, of more of the, of the theorist type. And I'm, you know, we're, we have some different kinds of talents, but we're basically very similar in that way. Yeah. What a fascinating uh, background relationship, you know, speaking of, communication between uh, right. hominids <laughs> you right. guys have a, such a fascinating history and it's interesting how you both have roots well going back to high school and then mathematics and uh wow it's, and and then into companies and starting your own companies and making money and uh, uh there's a whole big story there which is interesting to me as a clinical psychologist. That's where, where I would yeah. tend to get excited. Yeah. Um, so one of the words that you use a lot is emotional expression, and you've used it as you've been speaking to us. Is that the same thing as an emotion, or what is an emotional expression? Yeah, so, uh, so this is key. Uh, the the non-social animals, well before they were social animals, even, you know, even shrimp and a lot of the little guys that we often don't imagine <laughs> have much internal lives, um, have internal, in the, in the sense that they have emotions, they have feelings, they've got internal emotions, they feel stuff, right? And they feel stuff in certain circumstances that helps motivate them to do certain kinds of things. Uh, sharks, for example, aren't showing any emotional expressions, they're dead-eyed. To, to, you know, to humans, sharks are as dead-eyed as you get in some sense. They're dead-eyed stare. But internally, if, if they can smell, if they smell uh, you know, uh, blood, presumably there's something in them that's like super excited. They're, you know, and, and they want to go out and they, they get it. They, they're having a lot of the same emotional kinds of, 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 of feelings on the inside. The problem is that there's no reason for them to show it to anybody. So one of the problems with the word emotional expression in the first place is that in a 
it's now a term of art, but if you take it literally, it sounds like, oh, you're expressing to me your emotion. Like you want to show me your, your emotion, your internal emotion on the inside. And that, however, is, 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 is a bad way to start um, because we've been around for you know, a couple hundred million years, animals were around and they were deeply emotional creatures and never a one showed their emotions to anybody else. So the trick is why amongst the social animals did, it, did we want to start signaling to one another? And those signals, which we call emotional expressions, um, surely do have something to do with emotions. It's not like they don't have anything to do with emotions, but it ain't as simple as, oh, now the social animals just want to honestly tell everybody around them what their emotions are. No, because that's, that's not the point either. These emo you don't want to always just tell people, I'm feeling this, right? That's not necessarily what you want to do. Emotional expressions are about negotiation in a very, in the most general kind of sense, negotiating, co compromising to some kind of understanding with others, just as you and I are even here, there's subtle negotiations going on. I'm talking confidently for a while. And I'm checking your, cause I'm seeing your face for those on a podcast. Yeah. We're seeing each other in real life. <laughs> And yeah. I'm making sure that I'm not, I'm not going over some line, you know, if, you're, if I can tell that you're trying to talk, I'll go ahead and stop. So there's, there's, there's interplay going on all the time between he and I. And of course, my voice is emotional this entire time. I'm, I'm, if I said everything that I was saying in flat affect, you would have no idea whether I was more confident or less confident about any of these claims that I was making. And it would, it would, you would leave it flat. It would be like having all of the published literature, science literature, Imagine it all existing and then somebody like magically pulls out all this, the claims of statistical confidence levels. So now you've just got all these claims. You have no idea whether some of these are P less than 0.0001 or it's, you know, it's, or it wasn't significant at all. Emotions are all about saying how confident I am. So you say, I'd like some of that zucchini bread, Mark. And I go, no, that zucchini was meant for me. Mom said, and I say it confidently, mom said, right? Or I say, or I might say, mom, I think said, now I'm not very kind. I'm showing more humility. I'm not really sure. All of these things that we do are titrating the level of statistical confidence in some sense about, about what I, either what, what my confidence level is, or I might say, you don't even know what you're talking about. Now I'm making claims in some sense about your, uh, I'm making statistics claims about what your claims were. Um, that's how you communicate statistics amongst animals, amongst creatures like us. We don't really, you can, I, you can do a big speech in front of an audience and say, and P, you know, I think we should go, I think we should, some political, I think we should do P, I don't know, uh, whatever, we should, um, we should confiscate the property of the rich or whatever, some particular extreme claim. Yeah. And I say it with confidence. And so everybody then say, yeah, let's go do that. And they all walk out with their pitchforks because they're really excited to go do that because I was very confident. But if I stood up and I says, um, if we were to confiscate the riches money, there's a statistical, you know, there's a P less than 0.001%, you know, uh, I'm this much confident with P less than 0.01 that it will be better for us. And I say it with flat effect, but I put a P, no one's going to give a damn about what I'm saying because we're not designed to process statistics, actual statistics from statistics books. The way so that part, can, of, part of the design, it seems from what, what you're saying, yeah is this capacity for emotional contagion. Well, I mean, in the example you're talking that about the persuasive person and everybody says, grabs their pitchforks and says, right. yeah, yeah. Yeah, the more contagious part of this, I happen to be using an example, but I, and, and certainly this is a, a real thing that, that comes up and it comes up in politics and, and, and you know, collective hysterias and things like this are a big deal. But really what I, the biggest, the most common case is just two individuals carrying out some negotiation of some kind, whether it's just how much of something that they should share or how close that you should be walking past somebody. And they're kind of just, if you get too close, they're going to. Uh oh, dropped out close. again. These things happening all the time, right? Um, yeah. So when I say negotiation, it applies to both negotiating for a house and the very, you know, asset negotiation, boring kind of way, as well as the very subtle kinds of negotiations that we often don't think of as negotiations per se but it's just any kind of limited resource that there's, that there's, that there's, that you're vying over, you need to have a way that I can say, well, here's how much I think I should, you know, here's how much I think. Well, okay. Well then you can say, okay, maybe you're allowed to have more. You can do, you can get the, you can do these pushes and pulls and they're constantly happening. These, um, you you have in a social community, 
there's a new kind of force in some sense. Amongst non-social animals, you just have tooth and claw. These are the forces that you're bumping up against. You're only bumping up against them, and it's because they're tall, they're, you know, their claw is, is bumping up against your claw. But among social communities, the idea is that we had to evolve a way of avoiding tooth and claw fights and coming up with other ways to avoid that. And the way that we did this was to push our wills against one another. And our wills, when you, I push my will up against your will, I do that by saying, okay, I'm this confident that mo mom said I should get more of the zucchini loaf or whatever, or more of the, of the, of the muffin. And you go, no, mom didn't say that. And then if you, if you actually throw in enough confidence, I might back down. I go, I guess, yeah, he really does seem confident. Maybe I'll back down. And the key is, how do you convey confidence if you can't talk? You know how you convey confidence? And there's another setting where we convey confidence all the time, or you watch people conveying confidence. It's in poker. And in poker, you can have players, they're all standing around. Each of them has hidden knowledge, just like I have hidden knowledge about what, what mom said I should have, how much of that muffin I should have. And you have your own hidden knowledge about how much mom said you should have. Well, here we have hidden knowledge just in terms of my cards. And you've got your own cards in poker. And we're not allowed to talk. I mean, people can talk, they talk, you know, they trash talk all the time, but they do, right? The game doesn't depend upon trash talking. People in online, when you play, you can't talk at all. But nevertheless, they can have a conversation. And how do, they, how do I convey that I've got really strong hand, like I've got three kings? I convey that not by saying I've got three kings, because I could be lying. The way that I convey that is by betting. When I bet, I convey confidence. And I do so somewhat honestly. I mean, I could be lying, but I put something at stake, right? If I, bet, if I push all my chips and I go all in, you're probably thinking to yourself, okay, he could be lying, but he just pushed all of his chips in. So there's it, it a good chance he's telling the truth. The reason that emotional expressions work is not just that we're emotionally expressing, but when we do, we're also betting. So this is one key part of this, is, which, which is interesting. If I say, mom said, now I've conveyed confidence. I've conveyed that I know something that you don't. Now, if it turns out that mom comes in the room, like you call, you, like in, po in poker, you would say you call. You say, screw you, I'm not playing it. I'm just, let's just see, let's flip our cards over, right? Now, if it turns out that I was wrong, I'm going to lose all that that I, that I put in. What we lose when we bet or we, we be, we're really emotional, we trash talk, let's say, and it turns out we're wrong, we lose reputation. Because now no. the social community, because social communities are gossipy and they say, Mark is always trash talking. He was even trash talking on a podcast and he was found out later to be wrong. And so this is what gossip does. Gossip keeps track of all the bull crap that people say or the nice things. Mar or Mark was very conciliatory. Yeah, he was so nice. And he, he backed down immediately and he realized he was wrong, in which case I sort of unbet some of that. But all of emotional expressions are up, not just in saying claims about how confident I am or how confident I think you are or not confident, but they're simultaneously bets, very much like poker. It's a very, it's, it turns out mathematically it's a, a generalization of poker because can unbet for one thing and you're not allowed to unbet in poker unless someone's really really nice to you uh, mm -hmm. and uh and those bets are what keep us honest and those bets are what over time why i can become high reputation i can become really low reputation because it, you know do you have, do you know who i am i'll bet my entire reputation that blah 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 and then it turns out blah 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 was false and everybody's listening and so then i lose a lot of reputation you know those sort of douchebaggery kinds of guys are living it Sometimes they can keep rising, like Donald Trump is kind of like this. Whether you like him or don't like him, everybody agrees. He's a douchebag, right? And that's, his, his, that's the shtick. Certain people, they can rise reputation to that. But one false move, and they can, they can get crashed. So it's a dangerous life. So there's different kinds of strategies for how to play these poker games of life. Some people are just nice, like the chipmunks. No, you go first. You know, no, no, you go first. And they slowly build in reputation over time. because. And some people can just are just salesmen. They're just, they know how to convince people. They suddenly push in a lot of chips. Do you even know? What you're, you don't even know what you're talking about. And you're like, okay, I don't, I don't even want to now argue because now for me to argue back, I've got to put in so many chips that I'm, I don't want to lose face. So I'm just going to back down and just pretend that he's right, right? So these things happen all the time. There's different ways. So the, the, the way that society gets built is by virtue of, of billions of these interactions where people slowly fall, rise and fall in reputation yeah. each time. Mostly they're friendly interactions amongst your friends and neighbors and family. And 
they're a little bit more abrasive every once in a while. And those abrasive ones get remembered by the community and um, reputations change. Now you're explaining this in a sort of common sense way, but both you and Tim have a strong math background. And so that makes me wonder, do you write papers or somewhere in your books and so on? Are there pages and pages of complicated math formulas or not? No, so I mean, the, the trick in these books, uh, so I, uh, is, you know, when I'm, so this is the book. Um, so uh, it's not like, I mean, this is the one way to liken is that it, in Charles, when Darwin wrote his, his book on natural selection, actually in one of his other famous books, slightly less famous, is on, on emotional expressions. It's on, it's, um, I can't remember the exact title, but that was his other big thing, focusing on what are emotional expressions. And that was his other big attempt. But those books were the publications, right? That it wasn't like there was, it was summarizing a whole bunch of other publications or other people's work. So this is the, this is, this book is meant for other academics, but as well as for laymen, because when laymen read it, they're really reading the publication itself. And so it takes a lot of work to get it such that the math is in some sense hidden or it's explained sufficiently well that the math is sort of obvious of what it should be, or it's just done by, by diagrams. So as you see, you, you'll go through, so you'll see some diagrams yeah. where I'm trying to avoid saying what the formula is. In a few cases, I put into an appendix at the end, some of the stuff that I just couldn't figure out how to say in the main text. And it just got a little bit boggling, slowed, the, slowed ones move through it. And it wasn't crucial. And I, you know, I sort of describe it intuitively enough that they can keep moving. So, um, but yeah, there's math that's under, underlying it, but it's not hard math, um, it, it, but it's a, typically a mathematician would be the sort, you know, a theorist type would be the one that would be nevertheless doing it. Yeah. 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 So you and your co-author, Tim, you write, struggled for 10 years to solve the quotes, the big problem. What was the big problem? Well, I mean, was, we, and the, I mean, a slightly richer story there was that we had these two different intuitions that we thought would meld. His intuition was that somehow emotional expressions and poker were, were tied tightly together. Because there's lots of intuitions in regular, day. you know, we use these metaphors all the time. It's like, she just went all in right there. If she's just in an argument with yeah. someone, you say yeah. she's all in. And, and we, we use poker even people who don't get poker or play poker, they use metaphors and they sort of get that part of it in their bones. And I had a, a whole nother set suite of intuitions about how I thought um, that, how I thought that the structure of emotional expressions would have to be used. That was just a bare beginnings of what you see in the book because it was 10, 12 years ago. And over many years, then we kept trying to understand how, what is the work? Why do we really have emotional expressions? Everybody thinks that they have something to do with social but how can we really just derive it from first principles that no, this is the system and here's how it has to work. Okay. You're back. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yep. Yeah. You were totally gone for a while. All right, um, yeah, I'm going to have to work to piece some of this together. Um, so <clears throat> is, is what you're saying new it sounds like it's kind of radically new yeah i mean so here's i'd say there's the, like for example in, in the book harness something i haven't talked about today i just want to i talked about how lang you know writing systems look like nature the sounds of language sound like solid object events just because they harness us music um i argued in that book harness sounds like a human moving in your midst when you work out the sounds of humans and what they sound like they have a gait they have a beat there's a particular rhythmicity they have pitch modulations as they change they have uh, loudness modulations that go as the inverse square and when you work out the grammars of what humans sound like you can show that across all musics the music says has the same kind of signature structures of humans when they move now here's the sense in which that argument was totally not new the greeks had suggested that music is somehow related to movement so that, that intuition had been there for 2,000 plus years. But what, what I did now was make it rigorous. Like, okay, let, let's take that seriously. In fact, I didn't even know that until I got into it. And I was like, oh, they've already thought of this intuition. So how do you make that rigorous? How do you work out mathematically what humans sound like in some sense, the, the regularities of what humans sound like when they move? How can we test that across the corpora of, of human music and things like that? So in this case, 
there's there's a similar kind of thing. Almost everybody in the emotion literature thinks that emotional expressions are about coordinating social behavior somehow, about compromising or negotiation or just some kind of communicating to, to coordinate behavior amongst these complex social animals. But so everybody kind of agrees with that, and, and as do we. But the question is, how can you actually derive from first principles like, okay, here's here's why you have to have the, the space should have, let's say, it has to be a two-dimensional space where uh, there's aggressive and conciliatory and serious and casual. And then once you have that, there's this other two-dimensional space of acknowledgments or something like this. Once you combine them together, you end up with this four-dimensional space of 81 qualitatively distinct ones, which have these different kinds of bets of reputation that are associated with each. And it all comes for free from the mathematics of it, such that it leads to the space of emotional expressions that we know and love. So that's the diff, you know, so yes, it shares that sort of that basic intuition, but in this case, it derives all the stuff, um, shows how you can really derive everything within that framework. So in that sense, it's it's both not new and totally new. Yeah. And okay, I I understand that. Um, why is it important? Uh, what use can this be put to other than the expansion of knowledge and, and and i guess understanding what's it good for can you do anything with it yeah so look uh i mean nearly everything that we think that we're doing with spoken language much of what we think that we're doing with spoken language is actually being done by virtue of these emotional expressions even when we're typing and, and so emotional expressions often people are start to imagine the emotional expressions on their face or their gestures but no, even in texting, when you're texting with someone, you're emotionally expressing, not just when you're doing a little smiley face. Sure. All of these kinds of things, if you say, no, I, and you're, I'm typing, imagine I'm typing, no, I really think I'm supposed to get more than half of the muffin I'm typing to you, mom said, right? I've engaged in an emotional kind of, uh, it's clear that I'm, I'm, I'm making a claim about confidence. And of course, in this case, no one else is watching, but imagine like I'm doing this and tweeting it to you. So people are in principle watching. Uh, you can then argue back. These kinds of arguments of this kind are inherently still emotional expressions. They're still expressions of our confidence in a disagreement such that, and if I'm more confident, I say, I'm really, really, really sure mom said, then you might say, okay, maybe you're right. Maybe I didn't hear her right. You might back down. Even though much of what we do, here's the way I used to think about it. I used to imagine, because I'm a logician, mathematician, a physicist kind of guy, and we were like very you know, um, reductive, nerdy kind of guys. And I used to imagine that you've got language is the really important stuff with the propositions and the grammar. And then you have a little bit of icing on top of emotional bull crap, you know? And I would probably call it bull crap because the real stuff, because I'm, you know, I'm a logician, the real stuff, I'm a philosopher, the real stuff is all this important. It's like, no, I now I think it's the other way around. Almost everything that we're saying, we often, it doesn't even matter what the actual words are because people can tell what they're really saying by virtue of the emotional in implication. And so it's really is it's, it's the emotional expressions themselves. It's the substance. And then there's a little bit of whipped cream of words on top. That's the stuff that we've been, that's the language that we've been speaking for, for tens of millions of years. We've only been speaking language in the, in the formal sense of this other sense for hundred thousand years. And so even now when we're using language in this, in this new sense, we're still, using the same emotional expressive apparatus and all the same kind of pushing kind of negotiation styles, just using language now to do it. We're still doing the same old stuff. Now we're just not only using our faces and our gestures and our colors and our intonations of our voices, but we're doing it with the choice of words and the, and the, and the choice of language itself. Language is just being pushed into these same old frameworks. So we have a patent actually that's just uh, should go uh, patent pending such that we can talk about next week. If you want AI, uh, we were joking before we went live, uh, something that Dave said activated Alexa behind the, my my computer here and Alexa started responding like they always do. You know, and so Alexa and Siri and all of these AIs, they're dumb as rocks, right? I mean, yeah, they've got a nice human voice and they try to be, but they are dumb as rocks. The reason they're dumb as rocks is because what's truly smart aren't isn't the IQ nerdy chess like intelligence what makes people smart is understanding all these socio emotional signals and understanding how to play push push game 
that we're constantly playing all with our words and our emotional expressions. If they don't get that, they're just not smart. So you are, you AI, saying, are you saying that uh, there is an application for the stuff that you've been talking about and that application, one application potentially is to, to, to improve artificial intelligence? Right. So if you want human level AI, yeah. human level AI will never be um, human level AI without the socio-emotional level of, of intelligence. Yeah. That's what you need to do. That's what it is to be human. Well, to be a social creature at all is to exactly be engaged in these kinds of constant little push pushes, I call them, or little negotiations where you're pushing in a little reputation. Or you're backing it. Okay, now why don't you go for it? all of this, everything couched in these sorts of negotiations that we're not consciously aware of because we're so good, we just don't see them and we can't see them in some sense because just what we do naturally. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, our connection is not good, internet connection and yeah. dropping out and, and, and losing little pieces. So I think we should wrap it up here. Is there anything that you would like to say in conclusion? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I guess you, the other, another side of the application of this there's, is, is um, you know, a lot of people uh, setting aside, this is not the context to talk about whether masks work or don't work. One part of any conversation about masks has to be and in what it is that you're blocking. And one of the things that one is blocking is the emotional expressions by which humans have evolved, truly interact, right? So this is something that I think has been, uh, people have terrible intuitions about the things that they're best at, right? Almost everything that we're good at, um, we don't appreciate. Things that we think we're, we're good at are often the stuff that we never really evolved to do, uh, but the stuff that we're really good at, we're so good at, it doesn't feel like anything. And so we don't, we never consciously appreciate it. And our ability to communicate and to comprehend those around us and to, to see each other's faces and just click and all of these things, magical things happen with our brains um, that, make, that, that make society possible. All of these connections are lost when you put masks on. And that has to be part of all cost benefit analysis. Yeah. So you're referring to the COVID masks that we are, yeah, have all yeah. been wearing? And that yeah. I still wear when I go out into public. Yeah. Yeah. These, these have to be parts of the calculation. And yeah. one can't just say that emotional expressions aren't important. You could say they're, maybe they're not important enough, but they have to be part of the conversation. Okay. Well, we could go on and on. I mean, it'd be, uh, we could talk about psychotherapy and how these things apply to psychotherapy because I'm seeing, um, I'm seeing parallels really with some of the thinking in psychotherapy these days and the, the way that it's evolved to be less about the ideas that people had about and more about what happens in the transaction transaction between the therapist and the client. So there's a whole arena there, but Mark, I'm just afraid we're going to cut out again. So yeah. I want to thank you, uh, your book and your person, your delivery very mind stretching. And so I recommend the book to people on, on that, uh, on those grounds. And also we'll repeat that it's a, actually a readable book, <laughs> no big mathematical formulas. Uh, so thank you very much for being my guest today on shrink wrap radio. Uh, great to be here. Thank you, David.